great to see everybody today on um, test day. I sometimes wonder if people aren't all going to just come down to something. about <laughs> hell. What we're going to do today is I'm going to spend a little while talking about the development of the New Testament canon. That's what I'm doing as conclusion. Uh, I'll talk about what the canon is and how we ended up with, with our New Testament canon. Um, from the early, very earliest church days until the final conclusion. And you might be surprised to know that the church in the West, which is Catholicism and Protestantism, we didn't finally absolutely confirm our canon until the 16th century. Um, although 14 centuries earlier almost, we, we all agreed on what it was, but it wasn't officially a doctrine. Anyway, I want to talk about that. Um, <laughs> After I lecture for a while, we're not going to use the PowerPoint today because I didn't have a lot of material I wanted to put up there, and this is not something you're going to get on your test. And so, you know, I didn't have material. I felt like I wanted to make sure it was online so that you could, you know, you could refer to it. Um, once I have lectured for a while, and I doubt that it'll even be an hour on the New Testament canon, we will proceed with the test. I'll give you some instructions and reassurances and whatnot before we actually start <laughs> taking the test. Um, how many of you over here are not going to be taking the test today? Okay, that's good. I just wanted to make sure I've got enough of them because, you know, this being 30 pages long, this test was taking forever. <laughs> Father, we are grateful that you give us the ability to, to take your word and learn of it. We thank you for this opportunity we have had to grow in our understanding of the message you've given us in the New Testament, of the great servants of yours that have provided it to us, and of all that it teaches us about you. May this knowledge become in us a desire to know you better, to love you more. May we become closer and closer to you all the time because of it. We put ourselves in your care now. Ask for a blessing as we uh, learn this last lesson of the New Testament survey, and then also as we take the exam. We put ourselves in your care, knowing that you love us more than we even love ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, um, let us talk about the development of the New Testament canon. Are we on? Okay, we have been the whole time. Okay. <laughs> um, the, the canon of the New Testament, and canon is C-A-N-O-N. It is from the Greek word kanon, which was a, a measuring stick, literally a yardstick, although they didn't have yards. It was a stick that was rigid enough that it wouldn't bend, and it was marked off. And so canon came to mean, from that original uh, measuring stick, it came to mean anything that is used to um, set a, a firm standard. Okay, the firm standard being certain lengths. Um, and so the canon of Scripture are the books that we believe were divinely inspired. Not just somebody made this up. There's been a lot of that too, we'll talk about. But that were divinely inspired so that they could become the standard by which we came to faith and then evaluated our lives. So that's why the word canon, the yardstick of our lives, is the word that we use to apply to the Bible. Now... With regard to the 27 books that we have in our New Testament, the New Testament canon, those 27 books um, were, some of them were disputed for a period of time. The, I'm going to talk about some of the fallacies that you hear from the Da Vinci Code. If you were in church on Sunday, you heard me preach about the Da Vinci Code, at least if you were in the English language service. I preach a different sermon in Spanish service when I do that. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. The, uh, the biblical canon has been debated, but much earlier than most people think, there was almost universal agreement about what it should be, even though the final declaration, that is official church dogma declaration, of what had already been decided many centuries before, was determined by the Catholic Church at the Council of Trent in the 16th century. And... Uh, the determination, with the exception of the Apocrypha, was the same books that the Protestants had already accepted. The Eastern Church, that is the Orthodox Church, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, the uh, other Eastern Coptic churches, they had agreed on what they thought the Bible was by 692, you know, like a thousand years earlier, at the, council, the Second Council of Trulon. 
talk about that a little bit, but I just wanted to establish that what we mean by canon is the divinely inspired books that God has given us through human writers, but still given to us by God, that are our measuring stick, our standard for um, what it means to be Christians and then how we're supposed to live our lives. So let's talk a little bit about that. In terms of periods in the church, the first real historical period of the church is the period called uh, early Christianity. It is really from um, A.D. 30, right about the time of Jesus' death, to 325. That almost 300 year period, 295 years, was the period before the first ecumenical council of the church, the Council of Nicaea. So that's usually referred to as early Christianity. Now we can break that down a little bit further, which I'm going to do right now, to, in terms of when various major events happened in coming to the canon of, of the scripture. But I will tell you, next term, starting in the second week in April, one of the classes we are going to have is Church History 1 where we will look at from the time of Christ and the, and the apostolic age, as it's called, when the apostles were still alive, up until pre-Reformation, uh, right before the Reformation occurred in the 1500s. Okay, so we're going to look at, at almost 1,500 years of worth of history. I'd love to be able to break that up into like six classes, but unfortunately, you know, you're not going to be around here for, for five years of courses. We want to get, we want, we have people who want to get a degree, I think we can reasonably do that and get, get everything in in two years, which is fairly standard for a master's degree in the States. So, that early Christianity period from uh, circa AD 30, about the time of Jesus' death, to AD 325, we can look at that even broken up in a couple of different places. Uh, the first really key period with regard to scripture was the first hundred years from about well, 120 years or so, from A.D. 30 to about A.D. 150. Um, you'll remember that the New Testament was written roughly, and, and this is an outside parameter because it takes into account some differences that even evangelical scholars have, from about A.D. 40 to about uh, A.D. 100. You know, about that 60-year uh, range was when the New Testament was written. So when we talk about the first major period for the development of Scripture, we really are talking about A.D. 50, which is about the earliest time that these writings, you know, Paul's writings or the book of James, when they first started being recognized as being more than just somebody's ideas, that so like 10 years after they might have been written, up until about A.D. 150, about 50 years or so after the last of the New Testament books might have been written, but it took that long for them to really get settled in so that they were copied, distributed to people. Again, they didn't have email. So it took a while for this stuff to be widely distributed and then for them to develop a consensus that this was God's word to us. So that first hundred year period from AD 50 to about AD 150, we have a lot of different documents that were circulating amongst the Christian churches. Now you'll remember that this Christianity was not official then. It's by AD 50, it was still pretty darn small. And it certainly hadn't been recognized. It was about that time that we started experience perse experiencing persecution. First from the Jews, who saw this as a, as a heresy of the Jewish faith. And then we began to get persecution from the official government agencies, the Roman government, who didn't like the fact that Christians were unwilling to sacrifice to the, to the imperial cult, that is the cult of the Roman emperors. Um, it was required by law in the Roman Empire during this period that everyone be willing to burn incense at least to the Roman emperors as gods. Christians wouldn't do that, and so persecution started because of that. During this period of time, even though the church was persecuted, it wasn't firmly established, it was just beginning to grow and expand, um, we still had letters and gospels, which are <coughs> accounts of Jesus' life, um, literally from the word good spell or good news, uh, the old English, memoirs, uh, apocalypses, which are books of revelation, we had uh, sermons or homilies, collections of teachings, there was a lot of stuff being distributed, distributed in this first real hundred years of scripture being established, of the New Testament scripture being established at least. Now, a lot of those documents, or many of them, were apostolic in origin, meaning they either came from the apostles, like Matthew, or John, or Peter, or Paul. Um, others were accounts that were based upon first-person apostolic accounts, like the book of Mark, which we believe was the gospel according to St. Peter, since John Mark was Peter's secretary and assistant for many, many years. The, the gospel of Mark has always been considered pretty much the gospel according to Peter. 
So there were apostolic writings. They were immediately related to apostolic, to the apostles' writings. And then there were a lot of other things that came out. A lot of the other materials that came out, sometimes in order to gain credibility, they might claim they were written by Peter. You know, we have the, we have the Apocalypse of Peter, for instance, or the Revelation of Peter, which the church has not accepted as being part of the canon, but whoever it was that wrote that claimed it was written by Peter in order to get people to, you know, accept it more readily. And so we have a lot of that pseudepigraphal stuff, meaning false writing. Yes? How did they know that it's not from him? Like well, uh, because we, we have a, uh, a consistent track, and I'm going to talk about the four, the four things that were the, uh, became the four standards for canon, canonicity, the four standards that they used to determine if something was canon. But there are really two reasons why they would doubt and ultimately decide that the Apocalypse of Peter, for instance, wasn't for Peter. One, because the content was not consistent with the rest of Scripture. That idea of consistency of presentation. You know, there's stuff in there that you just you just don't accept. Even in the Apocrypha, which the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church accepts as part of Scripture, you get into the book Bell and the Dragon, and it starts talking about the, a dragon. Okay? Um, really? <laughs> and so the Church said, you know, that's kind of strange credibility. We don't buy that. At least the Protestants believe that. In fact, the Catholics didn't expect accept that as full canon until the Protestants rejected it, and the Catholics sort of did it to thumb their nose at the Protestants. Okay? That's in the Council of Trent. Um, but you get things like that, or wild things, like some of the early uh, uh, pseudepigraphal, which means pseudepigraphal well, means false writing. Some of the pseudepigraphal writings that, uh, trip that were supposed to be Gospels, they would have Jesus striking people dead when he was a child, getting angry at them and you know, nuking them right there, which does not seem consistent with the nature of Jesus. Or, as I've told you before, I think, you know, that Jesus, as a child, was, was so perfect that he worked, he helped his father Joseph in the, in the carpenter shop. Joseph was always screwing stuff up, and Jesus would miraculously fix it. You know, yeah. Joseph made a bed too short, Jesus just stretched it. You know, that kind of thing. So, the first, the first reason why they would reject things is that it simply was not consistent, either in theology or even in tone, with the rest of the writings. The second reason would be if they had no consistent witness that would attribute that. You know, there were a lot of early church people who testified that John Mark, who wrote the book of Mark, was the secretary and assistant to Peter. We also have the fact that a lot of the things that are in Mark are consistent, very consistent, the same content almost, as, as what the book of Acts records as some of the sermons of Peter. So we've got that internal consistency. We also have testimony of uh, people in the early church that yes, these historical pieces fit together and it makes sense that that was a writing of Peter's. Okay? Now, this was debated for, you know, some of these, a few of these books were deba debated for a long time because they didn't have exact kind of uh, connections between things. And for and they continued to find other documents and other resources. And from time to time, the church would decide, you know, we had a question about that, but, you know, something else has come up that makes us believe that yes, that is true. But never have we accepted documents that we felt were internally inconsistent in content or fundamental style. Okay? Does that make sense? Sierra, does that answer your question? Okay. Um, one of the earliest uh, firm that is written uh, evidences we have of the, the presence of New Testament Scripture is actually in Scripture. In 2 Peter, we have 2 Peter 3.16 says this, um, they're talking, it's talking about Brother Paul, and it says, He writes the same way in all of his letters, speaking in, them, in these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. What that means is that when Peter wrote Second Peter, which was probably 20 years after Paul's, you know, uh, 15 to 20 years after Paul's first letters were being written, Peter already is beginning to identify Paul's writings as being divinely inspired. He's already referring to them as a part of the scripture. When he says other scriptures, he probably means either there may have been some other writing of Paul, but particularly since he's using a comparison here, he probably means the Old Testament scripture. But even within the New Testament, there's an example, uh, that example that some of the writings of the apostles were already being considered to be scripture, divinely inspired. 
We then get, by the end of the first century, so we're still we're, we're within that 100 year period, right around uh, the year 100, uh, we get Clement of Rome, which was one of the <coughs> early, who, who was one of the early church fathers, and he quotes extensively from, from some of the letters of Paul. Now he doesn't actually call them scripture, but he does indicate, because the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, was the only thing that Clement of, of, uh, of Rome referred to as scripture. But he does indicate he believes God is speaking to us through the writings of Paul. So we know that by A.D. 100, within 70 years of Jesus' death, within about 50 years of the writing of the earliest of Paul's letters, or James, if it was about the same time, we have an example of the fact that people are beginning to recognize that this was God's message to us. And they're beginning to quote them and collect them. Oddly enough, one of the most important figures in the development of the New Testament canon was one of the worst heretics that ever existed in the church. Uh, it's a man named Marcion. Marcion was a bishop from Asia Minor who went to Rome. He lived about 130 to 140, or actually that's when he was writing, that's when he was collecting things. Marcion um, had very strong views, almost all of which the church has decided is a heresy. In fact, the Catholic Encyclopedia uh, version in 1913, when they really developed that, identified Marcion as probably the greatest threat that Orthodox Christianity, that is true Christianity, I mean, ever had. Marcion comes along and he begins to decide for himself which of these writings that are out there should be canon. He begins to collect the letters. For instance, we believe Marcion probably was the first one to try to collect a comprehensive set of all of Paul's letters to the churches. And he also collected various other writings. And the problem is that Marcion had some very strong theological views. He said that uh, the God of the Old Testament, for instance, was a completely different God than the God of the New Testament. And that the reason Jesus came was in order to, to do away with the wrong ideas that were presented by the God of the Old Testament. So he had some very unorthodox kind of views. Um, he did not like any of the writings that we, can, we think of that were available then. Um, and he did not think of them as being God's divinely inspired word, except for the writings of Paul. He really liked Paul. Weirdly enough, we've had people since then who accepted everything but Paul. <laughs> um, and, and there are people today, there was a minister here in town I know who said he would never preach, you know, he's not here anymore, who said he would never preach from Paul because he didn't like what Paul had to say. That idea of picking and choosing is something we've been doing for a long time. That doesn't make it right. Um, well, Marcion liked Paul. He did not like any of what we call the general epistles or, you know, the revelation of John. He did not like the book of Acts at all. His, the only one of the gospels he accepted was Luke, but he edited Luke very heavily. He took out any of the miraculous references to Jesus. And he referred to that as the Gospel of the Lord, which was his edited version of the Gospel of Luke. So Marcion, who collected all this stuff, he then declared that the canon, the official inspired books of the New Testament, were the writings of Paul and his version of Luke's Gospel, the Gospel of our Lord. The thing is that since Marcion was really the first one to do that, even though he was declared a heretic, and even though he took you know, real license with, with like editing the Gospel of Luke and rejecting the others, because he was the first one to collect this stuff, and Marcion was really evangelistic in his beliefs. Marcionism, as it was called, of those who became quite prominent. In fact, the church had to officially declare it a heresy because it was gaining a lot of traction. Marcion was a... Uh, Great you know, he was very politic, he had great public relations. And so people started believing this stuff. The church then had to come along and decide, we got to do something about this. And part of what we have to do is we have to figure out what we believe about what is the divinely inspired books of the New Testament. In fact, Marcy was the first one they called it the New Testament, uh, the Testamentum in Latin. Um, and we have to decide, we don't agree with anything he's doing, Marcion, and we have to prove that he's a really bad guy, so we have to come along and figure out what we think the New Testament, which is the word, the term Marcion had quoted, what the New Testament, what the new divine writings inspired canon that God has given us. And so Marcion, even though he's one of the worst heretics in the history of the church, and as I say, he was widely acknowledged, even today, as being one of the greatest dangers to true Christian faith, He's the one that first gathered a lot of this stuff together, and it was in response to him that the rest of the church finally started figuring out 
what is the canon of the New Testament. So in that regard, as wrong as he was theologically, Marcion was a major figure in the formation and development of the Christian New Testament. Make sense? You got that? Okay. We then come along a little while after Marcion, we have another major figure who you, you've referred me, uh, heard me refer to before, in the mid-2nd century, about 145 to 165, you get Justin Martyr, again one of the early church fathers, and Justin Martyr focused on the Gospels in a way that people hadn't specifically before. <coughs> Part of this is in response to Marcion, because this is right around the same time, within about 15 to 20 years of Marcion uh, beginning to do this. Uh, Justin Martyr called them the memoirs of the apostles rather than the gospels at that time. And he began to, um, Justin Martyr was the first one who really began to talk about these memoirs of the apostles, the gospels and some other writings, as being equal to the, to the Old Testament writings in terms of importance for us. Up until this point, remember, most of what people meant when they said scripture was the Old Testament. If you read the book of Acts, you read the great sermons in the book of Acts. Stephen, or the sermons of Peter, or Paul, almost always when they're trying to convince people that Jesus is the Messiah, how do they do it? They go to the Old Testament in order to show how Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So Justin Martyr comes along, and he begins to make distinct references to these memoirs of the apostles. He refers not only to various of the Gospels, but also he quotes extensively from Romans, from 1 Corinthians, from Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, 2 Thessalonians, and then minor references to Philippians, Titus, and 1 Timothy. It was around the same time that some of these early church fathers began to, to create um, a list that they considered to be questionable, too. You know, the, the ones that they thought they couldn't really rely on in terms of them being part of the, the New Testament canon or defined uh, the uh, particular writing. And they... They, this list varied from time to time. They didn't completely reject it, but they said, okay, we got questions about these. It included Revelation. Duh. I mean, you know, we all, we all struggle with Revelation, and they did from the very first. In fact, Revelation was the last book to be accepted as part of the canon. The, the Eastern Church did not accept it as part of the canon until the 600s. They finally decided, okay, we accept it, but not, you know, not for uh, till the... The Council of Trulon that I mentioned earlier, when they settled on the whole uh, the whole of the canon, and other books that they had questions about were Hebrews. Why might they have had trouble with Hebrews? Those of you who become experts, no, they don't know who wrote it. Okay, uh, that was one of the big questions they had about that. There was no clear authorship associated with it. They had other difficulties. You'll notice I said that Justin Martyr thought Second Thessalonians, but not First Thessalonians, was a you know, canonical book. Some of them, like First Thessalonians. Um, the letters of Peter, people had questions about the authorship, they weren't sure, and then later on other testimonies arose. Um, again, they, they, they couldn't go online and say, okay, tell me everything you know about First and Second Peter, and have somebody else having written an article about proving that it was... So, it took time for some of this stuff to get around, even though there may have been evidence elsewhere that someone testified firsthand. You know, uh, we, we get examples like the writings of John. Well, um, Irenaeus, one of the early church fathers I'll mention in a second, was close to Polycarp when Polycarp was an old man. Well, Polycarp, when he was a young man, had known John the Evangelist. And so he knew, Polycarp knew what John had written. Polycarp shared that with Irenaeus, and later on, Irenaeus was significantly responsible for making sure that we understood that John wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. So, but, but some of that testimony might not have been known, for instance, in the Greek-speaking East at first. And it took them a while to get that information. Okay? I mentioned Irenaeus. Um, Irenaeus, about 160 or so, Irenaeus starts talking about what he called the tetramorph. Tetra means four. The tetramorph were the four Gospels as canon. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In fact, Irenaeus is the one who most firmly established that there are four Gospels. In fact, Irenaeus goes on at great length arguing that there can be no fewer than four and there can be no more than four. Part of the reason he's emphasizing that is that this was around the time, a little bit later, uh, than Marcion, when Marcion's saying there's only one Gospel that's valid. So Irenaeus makes a big point of saying no, there's no less than four. So uh, Marcion, there are also the Ebionites and some other people that the church declared to be heretics, 
They had various other ideas. The Ebionites had one version, an um, uh, Aramaic version of Matthew, that they said was the only gospel. Marcion said only Luke. Irenaeus comes along around 160 and declares there are four gospels, no more, no less. And then he goes on in great poetical effort to demonstrate why four. He says, as there are four winds, as there are four corners of the earth, as there were four beasts in the visions in Ezekiel and in Revelation, there's four creatures with four faces, and on and on. He comes up with all of these different analogies from nature and from Scripture about why four is so important in order to argue that there had to be four Gospels, no more, no less. Okay. Now, that idea of a fourfold Gospel, even though Irenaeus gets a little crazy in terms of why, how he defends it, became very quickly the standard. Now, we're right now in the latter part of the second century, you know, between 160 Irenaeus and 200. And everybody is agreeing on these four Gospels. All right? Um, everybody is beginning to agree on some of the other books. Now, I say that because you think back to um, what... Well, I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. I'll, let me jump back. Around the same time that the four Gospels were being uh, proclaimed by Irenaeus, it wasn't a universal belief at that time. Almost exactly at the same time, there's a man named Tatian who was uh, from Assyria. Tatian the Assyrian. He takes the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and he combines them into the first harmony of the four Gospels. So he takes the four, all of the details, and he puts them together in one. So the first harmony of the Gospels, you, know, you all know that word? A harmony of the Gospels, in our case, most of the time now, it will be a book that has four columns. And it will have, whenever, like the story of the woman caught in adultery, if it, if it exists, if a story existed or a passage or a statement exists in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, they list them together so that you can see which, which passages are in which Gospels and which aren't. Well, Tatian went the next step and he actually put them all together in one document, you know, in a way that he thought would give us a seamless kind of flow. That became very popular. That was the goal called the Diatessera, Diatessera, the first harmony of the Gospels. Um, during this same time period, again between about 140 and 200, or maybe 220, the early uh, Christians who were concerned about making sure we had it straight, the, they're called the proto-Orthodox Christians. The early church fathers that were concerned to make sure we had an Orthodox, or a true understanding of the Christian faith, they start getting very specific about which of these books ought to be, ought to be uh, part of the canon. Particularly they do it because there are a number of heresies that start becoming real problems then. <laughs> You've got Marcionism. You've got Gnosticism, which we've talked about. You all know about Gnosticism, this, this uh, heresy. It was a philosophical heresy that said that the material world was bad, the spiritual world was all that mattered, and that um, you get saved because of secret knowledge. And Jesus, what, since the physical body doesn't matter at all, there's no such thing as sin in terms of sexual sin or that sort of thing. And Jesus, therefore, didn't need to be a savior. He just came to be our um, truth giver. You no, know, he shared the secret knowledge you need. So Gnosticism was there. Montanism was another heresy. And because all of these heresies are all making their own claims, it was during that period, the time of Marcion, you know, 140, 150, up until 200 to 220, that they're really working hard to nail this stuff down. That's the proto-Orthodox movement. Um, from around the same time, late 2nd century, um, and again, 2nd century ends at 200. Remember that? The 1st century is from 0 to 100. 2nd century is from 100 to 200. People say 2nd century and they think, oh, that's in the 200s. No, it's earlier than that. Okay. So there's a document called the Mauritarian Canon, which came from the late 2nd century, which identified which books were supposed to be part of the canon. That's part of that proto-Orthodox kind of movement. And they began to identify very clearly, here are the books that ought to be part of the canon. Um, by the middle of the 3rd century, which is the mid-200s, we have a very clear canon established and agreed upon by all of the churches. Not by any council of the church, not by any high authority, but all of the churches have pretty well agreed, and there are a number of documents that, that state this, that the books that we currently have in our New Testament canon, there are a couple that still had questions, particularly Revelation and Hebrews, but they generally are included with question marks. Okay, 
That happened about the mid-third century, not in the fourth century. The Nicene Creed met in about 325. I say about because it, covered, it was a long... These, some of these councils of the churches met for five or six or eight or ten years. I mean, they took for, forever to do this. Um, the Council of Nicaea is the one that so many people wrongly claim decided what's in the New Testament. How many of you were heard my sermon on Sunday? Okay. Where I quoted the, the section of the Da Vinci Code where the character Lee Teabing claims they voted not only on the divinity of Jesus, which was the point I was making, but they voted on what scripture was. We, the, the records of the canonical decisions or the canon decisions that we have from Nicene Creed do not include any statements about what was included in the, in the New Testament as canon. Council of Nicaea, we have no documents that say they did that. The point, however, is that 75 years at least before that, the church had decided already what ought to be considered canon, that is, divinely inspired documents of the New Testament. And it was quite universally accepted. There were some people who disagreed. They, you know, they didn't like Revelation. They didn't like Hebrews. They weren't sure if John the Evangelist wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. They, you know, etc. There were a few questions. But mostly those, there was fairly universal acceptance of that. Um, when we do get into the 4th century, in his Easter letter of, of 367, Athanasius, the Bishop of Alexandria, one of the most important historical figures in the church, Athanasius, he gave a list of exactly the 27 books that we have in our New Testament canon, and he was the first one who said, these are canonized, which means they are accepted as being of God. When a saint is canonized, it means they are holy, that they are of God. So canon, canonized, those words obviously are the same. The first council we have, that is, big church gathering that officially established the canon, was not the Council of Nicaea. They didn't do that. The Council of Hippo Regis in North Africa, remember uh, August, Augustine, St. Augustine, was the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa. Um, the Council or the Synod of Hippo Regis in 393 was the first council that declared absolutely by you know, the authority of the church as God has given it, this is the, these are the 27 books. But they decided 150 years before that that that's what they ought to be. They just hadn't, nobody had stamped it as officially approved by the church until the late 4th century. Okay? Um, I know you guys are so anxious to take this test. <laughs> I will mention one other time period which was significantly important. I said to you earlier that early, the early Christian church period was considered between around A.D. 50. You might say A.D. 30, the death of Jesus, but around A.D. 50, up until 325. 325 is a significant date because that's the, that was the Council of Nicaea. The next major period of church history that we would talk about, if you want to cut it in big slices, is the period of the seven ecumenical councils. That's a period that runs for almost 450 years. From 325, Council of Nicaea, the first great ecumenical council. And you know what ecumenical means? It means everybody. Okay, everybody together. From 325, the Council of Nicaea, until 787, 450 some years later, 787, we have the second Council of Nicaea. Well, in between that, you know, we had the Council of Ephesus, the uh, Quinisex Council, and various other councils in there. There were seven total councils that were called the Ecumenical Councils because they were efforts to bring everybody together to decide the orthodox issues of the faith, or rather the, the issues of the orthodox faith. Okay? Um, every one of those councils, from not counting Nicaea, but from, the, uh, from there on, from the 400s on, had something to say about affirming the various books that we know of as in the New Testament. Okay? Some of the books that were questioned over a period of time, uh, in addition to Revelation and Hebrews, there have been questions about the book of James, about uh, the book of Jude, the second epistle of Peter, the second and third John. There have been questions about that. But you need to know that while sometimes there have been questions over those, the church finally came around, because when all the information was gathered, to say, yes, these are canonical, they're consistent with the rest of Scripture, we feel there's sufficient justification historically to know who wrote them. 
Hebrews being the only exception without the author, and yet the content was such that it kind of overwhelmed the fact, it, it sufficiently uh, was more significant in terms of content for people to say, even though we don't know who sure <clears throat> wrote it, we do believe this is God's word to us. There were other writings that did not get accepted. The Acts of Paul, the Shepherd of Hermas, the Apocalypse of Peter, the Epistle of Barnabas, the Teachings of the Apostles, um, the various books, and there, there actually are several categories of books. There is the canonical books that we have. Then there is what we call the apocryphal books, which historically have sometimes been called deuterocanonical, which means second level canon. We don't believe that they're canon at all. We, you know, Martin Luther, for instance, said they were valuable to read, but they were not equivalent to scripture. And then you have the pseudepigraphal books, or false writings. Those include things like the Gospel of Thomas and some of these that I just mentioned, the Shepherd of Hermas, etc. You get uh, you get very liberal scholars uh, these days. Uh, Elaine Pagels is one of the worst. <laughs> these people who try to say, well, the Gospel of Thomas should be you know, accepted just as much as the other books that we have in the New Testament. Well, I read to you all a while back, right? The passage, some of the passages, some of the statements from the Gospel of Thomas. You don't have to have your head screwed on completely straight even to read that stuff and say, no, this is not the same. This does not, you know, like the statement with it where it says, the apostles told Jesus to send Mary away, and Jesus said, don't worry about Mary, she'll be fine, I'm going to turn her into a man. And when I turn, to, turn her into a man, then she'll be eligible for heaven. In fact, all women that I turn into, actually male was the word, male. All the women that I turn into males will then, then be able to enter into heaven. I mean, it's got stuff like that in there, and you go, Say what? <laughs> you know? Uh, very strange. You, we, we move on forward in 394. Uh, Jerome was commissioned by Pope um, Damasus I to write a Latin version of the Septuagint of the Old Testament and also to translate some of the New Testament books into Latin. This was because Greek had been the dominant language. That's why they translated the Old Testament Hebrew into Greek in the Septuagint, the 3rd century B.C. We're now into the end of the 4th the, uh, the century A.D. The Pope Damasus asked Jerome, a great scholar of the church, to translate it into Latin, because now this is the Roman period, not the Greek period. So they translated it into Latin, and at that time, in addition, the Latin Vulgate not only was a translation of the Greek Septuagint, but it also used what was called the uh, Damasian List from uh, Pope uh, Damasus I, which were exactly the 27 books that we have in the New Testament. The, uh, the Damasian List was the, the Pope Damasus tells Jerome, here are the books I want translated into Latin in the New Testament. And it is the 27 books that we have. And that's why the 27 books that are part of the the Latin Vulgate, as it's called, which became the official Bible of the Catholic Church with the addition of the Apocrypha. Jerome did not believe that the Apocryphal books, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, you know, uh, the books of Ezra, Ez, uh, Esdras, Bell and the Dragon, you know, various others, Tobit, Judith, did not think they were part of canon, but he included them because he thought they were valuable for history. Okay? So all of that stuff later on the Catholic Church decided. Now, when we get to the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther comes along. <clears throat> Martin Luther had serious problems. We always talk about Luther not liking the book of James, calling it a right straw epistle. Luther actually had trouble with four books of the New Testament. He didn't like James. He, didn't, he wasn't sure about Jude, Hebrews, or Revelation. Luther decided not to exclude them from the Bible, which he was in a position to do that because he was starting all over again. But he, he, in more than one occasion, he suggested they sh maybe shouldn't be part of the canon. When Luther developed his German language Luther Bible, and as I think I've said in this class before, Luther not only translated, uh, he not only provided the New Testament in the common language of the people, but in doing so, he actually created modern German. You know, his version of the German New Testament really established modern German from, from uh, Old World German. Well, when he created the Luther Bible in German, he put those four books, Hebrews, James, Jude, and Revelation at the back. Of course, Revelation's at the back anyway for us. But it's because he wasn't sure that they were okay. But he decided not to exclude them from the Bible. Uh, he did, however, it was Luther that, that pushed to remove all the deuterocanonical books, that is, the Apocrypha, from the Bible. 
He also had questions about the book of Esther. It was the other book that he had a problem with initially in the Old Testament. And why would he have trouble with the book of Esther? It never mentions God. And yet Luther's final conclusion was, he asked the question, and this became Luther's, Luther's uh, sort of his own rule as to how you could decide. He said, well, does it urge Christ? In other words, does it urge people toward Christ? And he finally decided Esther was okay because it tells the story of the survival of the people from whom Christ came. And that was sort of his reasoning on it. When Protestants came along uh, after Luther, there are a number of different uh, confessions where the canon of the New Testament was established. There was the French Confession of Faith in 1559, the Belgic, or Belgian as we would say, Confession of 1561, the Westminster Confession of Faith, one of the truly great confessions of the faith, in 1647 during the English Civil War, and then the Church of England in 1563 established the 39 Articles. All uh, four of those great confessions of the Church all established the 27 books of the New Testament as being the canon. So they sort of locked it in. In addition, Protestants, from Luther's time on, we established four primary criteria for canonicity. The four things that have to be answered in the affirmative in order for something to be accepted as canon. The first one is that it have apostolic origin. Either it be written by an apostle, or that it be written by somebody who's, did, who's giving first-person testimony from an apostle, like John Mark again. So apostolic origin. Second, universal acceptance. It had to be that all the major Christian communities in the ancient world agreed on this. And again, remember, before there was any official anything, a long time before that, the churches had agreed, this is what we think God has given us as the canon. The third, so you've got apostolic origin one, two, universal acceptance. Third, liturgical use, that the early Christian communities had used these writings as part of their ongoing gatherings that they were read publicly, which used to be done a lot, uh, and perhaps even used during the time of the Lord's Supper for weekly, you know, week, special weekly service. And the fourth thing is consistency of message. That's why we didn't, we didn't buy uh, some of the books that talk about Jesus doing things that certainly don't sound like they're in the character of Jesus, even when he was a kid, or dragons, or, you know, women being turned into men so they'd be eligible for heaven, the kind of thing like that that just is not consistent with the whole rest of what the message seems to be to us. It's kind of not believable. Okay? So those four things, apostolic origin, universal acceptance by the early church, liturgical use by the early church, and consistency of message with the rest of Scripture. Any questions about any of that? Karen? Um, when when they, were, they were persecuted for not doing the incense to the Roman heads, how come the Jews weren't? The Jews had been, had been exempted from that early on. The reason being, the Jews were always very valued as a people. You know, when Alexander met you know, the, the Jewish people at Jerusalem, he was so impressed by them, he just walked by Jerusalem. He didn't destroy them. He, loved, he thought their book was great, partly because the book said that somebody will come from Greece and defeat the Persians, which he had already just done, like last week. Uh, and he admired their scholarship, the fact that of all the people he'd ever met, every young man, at least every boy, was taught to read. You know, all the children pretty much were taught to read, but they were taught Holy Scripture. They were taught, all of them were educated. So when he goes down to Alexandria and establishes the city of Alexandria, one of 20 Alexandrias, George Foreman, the George Foreman of the ancient world, he had at least 20 cities that he named after himself. Um, when the in city of Alexandria, when they wanted somebody to really provide scholarship, they invited Jews to come down from Jerusalem. So that at one point, when Alexandria was the second biggest city in the Roman Empire, a third of the population was Jewish. Well, all of that means that throughout that whole ancient period in the Eastern Mediterranean, from the time of Alexander especially, well up into the Roman times, the Jews provided a very important service as scholars, as academics. Um, you know, they were pretty particular. The Romans, when they first started the, uh, to, to enforce, when they took over the whole Eastern Mediterranean, of course they didn't start there, they started in Italy. Uh, when they took over the Eastern Mediterranean, they tried to begin to enforce the, the, some of these cultic practices. The Jews absolutely refused from day one. And after several years of the Romans first threatening and then actually killing Jews for this, they finally said, look, this stubborn bunch of folk, we're going to wipe them out before they do this, so let's make one exception to this rule. 
Okay, well, let the Jews get away with it. Nobody else. <laughs> it's also true that early on, when they made that exception for the Jews, the imperial cult was not, they were not as adamant about it as they were later. You know, Julius Caesar was the first one after his death in, in, in 44 BC that they established that he was divine and that they would recognize him as divine. And then they did the same thing for Caesar Augustus. Later on, the, some of the later emperors, Nero, for instance, and the worst of all, Domitian, Domitian insisted that people call him or address him as my Lord and God. And so some of these later ones who were still alive earlier on, it was only the guys that were dead that they, they deified. Later on, some of the living ones, like Nero and Domitian, insisted that they be worshipped as gods, and they were so adamant about it that it got much more aggressive. There was a lot less latitude. Um, and in fact, Domitian had himself named censor of the empire. Previously, that had been a position of the government. The censor not only maintained the census, but he also made, made sure that public morality was maintained. Public morality included worshiping the, the, right, the right things, including the emperor. So, long answer to your question. The Jews had been let off early on when it was not as serious an issue as it was later on for the Christians, during the Christian time, and because they realized that the nature of the Jewish faith was they were not going to worship anything else or anybody else. They were not going to worship the universe. And so we either kill them all now, which we're not willing to do because they provide a pretty important service, or we can make them the only exception. It's probably true that the reason that the, the Romans were so unwilling to make an exception for the Christians is because they'd already made one exception, and they felt like if they made another one, they were going too far. We've already let the Jews off the hook on this imperial worship thing. We're not going to do it again. And so the, the Christians were not exempted. And you have people like Polycarp, who was a very, very old man, the Bishop of Smyrna, who everybody loved, everybody loved, refused to burn incense to the emperor, and was crushed to death as a martyr, um, even though nobody had anything against him. But he, but he, you know, he wouldn't do it. Any other questions, Suzanne? So were Jewish Christians included along with the Christians in? Persecution because they wouldn't light incense? Well, um, generally, Jewish Christians were thought of as Christians fairly early on, and the reason is because the Jews rejected them. Okay? A Jewish Christian, the Jewish synagogue and community would not receive them, and so the only place they could be associated at that point was with the Christian church, and so they were perceived as Christians by the Romans and by everybody else. You know, once they declared that they believed Jesus was the Messiah, the other Jews wouldn't have anything to do with them, and so they. Now, nobody would have recognized it as being part of the Jewish people anymore. All right, anything else? Okay, you've got some sense of the research. Let's see, what, what should we do now? <laughs>